Hello, and welcome to Cannabis Marketing Live. I'm your host, Kendra Losey. We are here, all puff, no fluff. And I'm really, really excited about our topic today. We are going to be talking with Lars Helgeson. Here, he is the CEO and founder of Green Rope. Lars, welcome. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you for yeah, thanks. It's great to be here. Absolutely. I am really excited about talking with Lars today. I don't know how much people know about CRM and how, what a useful tool it can be for your marketing and your business. So I asked Lars to join us because he's been working with cannabis clients as well with his CRM tool. So Lars, welcome. And can you tell us a little bit about how you got started with your company, Green Rope? Sure. Yeah, we've been around for quite a, quite a long time. Um, back in 2000, we started with an email marketing company called Cooler Email, and then um, over the years, we kind of we realized that one of the big problems that this face is the integrated information. And so, our customers were sending a lot of emails, and then they were getting reads and clicks and unsubscribes and all these other this data. And then it wasn't able to really move into other parts of the business. And so we realized that the real challenge that businesses face really is about understanding the information that they're gathering. So you start talking to our customers, and you've got people that are doing sales, you've got people that are doing marketing, and not always just email marketing, but now there's social media, and you've got people that go to trade shows, and then you've got things like events that you're running. There's all these things that are generating data. And so what we saw was that the real problem that the businesses face is how to make that all make sense. And so the traditional approach to this was to create the CRM as the core of your business and then do all this integration to pull the different pieces together. And so, and it's still a lot of the way, it's, it's this way for most businesses where they'll go, say, well, I want to get the traditional CRM, which a lot of cases would be like a Salesforce or a Microsoft or an Oracle. And then they'll say, well, now we need to integrate our marketing, we need to integrate events, we need to integrate customer service, we need to integrate sales, we got to, you know, all these things have to kind of get pulled together. And then they end up buying lots of different software and then they end up linking them all together and it gets super complicated, super expensive, and usually it gets so unwieldy that people are doing most things by hand or they just don't use the CRM because it's a pain. And so we, we decided to come up with something that would be a better solution. Absolutely. And as somebody who's worked with clients that have implemented, and even companies, when I worked at the university, we had giant, you know, Salesforce implementations, and it creates a lot more work and money in the long run, I think, when you're trying to add on all the different modules and things you need. Um, I want to step back a little bit, and can you define CRM as you see it, as so that way we can frame the conversation a little bit more? Yeah, and, and it kind of it kind of goes with what we created as Green Rope. Um, the relationship is really what drives a business. The, the a business with no relationships that isn't able to communicate or listen to what your customers or your leads are doing is not going to be able to grow and or, or really even operate very efficiently. And so, in our mind, when we talk to a customer about what CRM is, so much of it is a cultural change. So the software is there to go with the culture, but it's about saying that we as a business care enough about our customers that we're going to manage everything in one place. And so that if I can look at a customer or I can look at a lead and I can see a history of everything they've ever done that relates to our business. And so I can see what have they done with every email that I've sent. Have they opened it? Have they clicked on it? Have they visited our website? Have they liked us on social media? Have they watched a video? Have they attended an event that we've done? All of these things, I mean, that's just a, a slice, but all of these things are ways for us to measure our relationships. And if you can measure it, then you can track it and you can keep, you, you get a sense of what's working and what's not working for your business. And on top of that, once you have that information, you have the ability to communicate over all those different channels, you can do things like marketing automation. And marketing automation and CRM are two things that are inextricably linked. These two are, have to happen close. If you're going to automate the way you communicate with customers, you have to understand your customers. And you can only do that if you have a CRM that's able to track the entire relationship. What happens with most businesses is they kind of get part of the story. Most times when you talk about CRM, People think of that as a sales tool, 
not as a culture. They think of it as like, well, I use my CRM to track when I keep notes of something. And then somehow that data has to get over into a marketing tool. And the marketing tool has to then set up some way to automatically send out communication. And it gets super complicated and expensive. And no one really knows really who's tracking what. And it turns into a big mess. And then eventually everyone just kind of walks away. and says, I'm just going to do this the way I know how. And they go back to their spreadsheets. So what we want to do is create a system. It's a culture. It's software. It's it's a way of thinking about the way the business runs so that everything is tied together. And it creates a team way, a team based approach at how you manage your relationships. Because you might have a marketing person that talks to, that communicates with a lead in one way. And then you're going to have a salesperson that's going to be communicating with that lead in a different way. And then maybe they'll go to a trade show or maybe you'll host an event and then you'll want to keep track of that. So, you know, and then you'll have someone else that may be in charge of social media. So you've got all these different channels, all these different ways of measuring this relationship by different people in your company. And if you can create this team-based approach, everyone works together. You share information. So when the salesperson makes the call, they know what they did with every email they received. They know if they've been to a trade show. They know what they've liked on social media. So there's all this information helps each part of your business work better. At a large scale, one of the examples I've used in the past is say, so this is at a very large scale, right? So American Express, for example, right? Like I worked at a company, the company closed. I had my American Express. I was getting, you know, why haven't you paid this bill from one department and hey, apply for this credit card from another department. So on one hand, they're threatening to throw to send, you know, the business <laughs> slash me to collections. On the other hand, they're offering me this shiny new card and they're just not doing a good job. You know, that's a very, it's an example of a very siloed company that wasn't paying attention to how the customer is, you know, to what's actually being sent and communicated to the customer. So I think that's an extreme example at a very large company, but it's the same thing, right? We've seen it with smaller organizations and smaller companies that do the same thing if you have different departments talking to the same person um, and not tracking that information. So I think there's so many benefits for CRM, and I know there's a lot of cannabis-specific tools coming into the marketplace as well. Specifically, I've seen a lot from the standpoint of B2C. So part of what I wanted to focus on the conversation with you, Lars, is a little bit more around B2B. And for businesses in the cannabis space that are looking to sell to other businesses, what are the benefits of CRM beyond what you just talked about, um, but specifically for the B2B perspective? So when you talk B2B, um, it, it is a little different than B2C in that you tend to use, so in the CRM world, we use the term opportunities. Mm -hmm. So an opportunity being, if I'm a business, maybe I'm a distributor, I'm a grower, and I need to get information, I'm only going to work with a finite number of, of distributors, for example, or, or dispensaries. At those stages of the sales process, you're going you're gonna to have various different ways that you're going to sell to them. And you're going to have various different stages of that sales process. So you're going to say, you know, you may have sort of the, the intro stage where you're talking to them and saying, you know, hey, this is our product. This is this is how much we can sell. This is the quality of our product, whatever. Um, this is how much it costs. And so you'll be going through the, a sales process. And you may have different conversations as you go through. And then as, the, as you establish the relationship and hopefully you're doing sales, you can manage the, um, the distribution of your product and then keep track of how much you're sending, how much you're selling, what the revenue is, all that. So when you talk B2B and you're looking at these opportunities as a way to manage this, from a management perspective, you want to be able to look at all the opportunities in your pipeline. And you're going to say that I am. I have various different stages. Now, again, remember that in the sales process, especially now, things aren't necessarily linear. So you may go down a sales funnel and you may get to a certain point and that potential customer could disappear. They may say, call me back in six months. They may just, you know, you know, they, they may say, yeah, let's go ahead right away. So they may go right through the funnel immediately. So you've got different speeds that people are going to go through your funnel and you're going to want to measure how effective you are at moving people from stage to stage to stage. So if you're a large organization and you have multiple salespeople, being able to track 
how much is in each stage of your funnel, how long does it take you to get from stage one to stage two to stage three to stage four, and then what percentage do you have of people moving from stage one to stage two to stage three to stage four. And so with opportunity management, you have the ability to keep track of a very complex sale and then measure the effectiveness of that sales process. So what we do when we work with customers is we help them understand what exactly are you selling and what are those stages of the sales process because every business is going to be a little bit different. And that's sort of a a little bit of a trap when it comes to things that are specific for just one niche because they're going to try to force you in a certain way of thinking. And so it's sort of the opposite problem of getting like this traditional CRM where you have to build absolutely everything from scratch. If you go to the other side of the spectrum and you say, well, every other rower does this exact method, then that may not work the way you want to do business. And so uh, what we do when we work with our customers is we can talk about the strategy of what their sales process looks like. How do they want to manage it? And then how do you track that information? What information do you want to actually keep track of as someone moves through that sales process? Awesome. And I have very specific questions for you about each of those steps and getting started. For those of you who are watching, I just want to point out, Lars actually wrote the book on CRM right there. That's Lars. (laughs) So he not only knows what he's talking about, but there's resources that he's actually created that you guys can use and access. And so I want to make sure that you guys know those resources are available for you. Um, I have, like I said, very specific questions for Lars. Those of you watching, if you have questions, feel free to jump in with your comments and we'll get to those throughout as well. So Lars, you mentioned a lot of, you know, how you guys work with businesses, but I want to step back a little bit and talk about getting started. A lot of people think that CRM is such a daunting task because it's become this huge thing, right? It's become the Salesforce type of thing. So how do you recommend that people get started? What are steps that people can take to actually understand what they even need to begin with? And that's a really good point because you don't dive into anything like this, especially something that could be potentially this complicated and such core to your business without researching it first. It's sort of like, I mean, who buys a car by walking onto a lot and then saying, oh, I'll pick that one. (laughs) You know, I mean, everyone does research for for reason. You know, it's the same thing with your business. And so you want to think about what your sales process looks like. And so what we do is we call this, and I know we'll touch on, we'll probably touch on this a little bit later, but we look at what the customer journey is like. And what that is, is understanding how does someone get from learning about your brand to learning about your brand, to to becoming like more familiar with what you do. And then learning how do they, how do they become a customer, becoming a customer, And then from there, how do you turn them into an advocate, someone who really loves what you do? And so you have to map and model what that process looks like. You have to really step, take that step back and think strategically about how are people going to learn about you? What are you going to do when someone goes to your website? Are you going to send them an email? Are you going to send them a text message? Do you have, have somebody call them? Do you want them to fill out a form? Do you want to try to encourage them to like them on social media? Social media channels are you going to try to inter- try to entertain them on? And so, I mean, you have you have a lot of questions to answer first. So you think about that, and then you think about who your target market is. If you're B two B, what kinds of businesses are you selling? To? If you're B two C, what kinds of people are you selling to? What do you need to know about those businesses or people to be able to effectively market to them? Because we want to be a person and personalize the messages that go out to these people or these businesses. So, for example, if you are selling B2B and you want to sell to, say, the medical industry for medical or cannabis, then you've got a different kind of information that you're tracking. And you're going to, you're going to personalize the messages differently. Same with, you know, if you're, if you're selling to dispensaries, is it geographically? a certain brand? Are there certain types of shelf space that you're looking for? Certain types of products that they sell? So there's a lot of information that you have to understand and think about with your business before you even start. And so once you do that, you can you build what we call as a data model. So a data model isn't anything that's supposed to, it's not complicated or whatever, but really all it is is saying, 
I know what I want to sell. I want to know how I want to sell it. But to do that, I have to store a certain amount of information about these these potential customers and customers. What is that information? Do I need to know their gender? Do I need to know their age? Do I need to know if it's B2B? Do I need to know the size of the dispensary? Do I need to know their, their throughput volume? That kind of thing. So you're, you're looking at all of the things that you need to know. So it's really about understanding process, understanding your market segments, and understanding your data model. Once you have that figured out, then you go to a CRM because that's how you drive the requirements of what your CRM should be able to do. So you as a business should go to the CRM company and say, this is what I need the software to do to support me. I need a demo with the software so you can show me how do I do X. And if you go and you walk through the CRM and they're unable to show you immediately in the demo, this is how you would do this, whatever it is, then that CRM is not going to be a good fit for you. Right. And that's usually what happens. Usually people do this. They, they do the research for what they need their CRM to do after they pick their CRM and they realize the CRM can't do it. And then they end up doing this hodgepodge, kludgy thing where they try to make all the pieces fit together and it turns into a giant mess. So we want to do that first. We want to do our homework first. I, I've been involved on both sides, right? Like I have helped implement two different CRM systems when I was at the university. I've helped make recommendations for clients and I've been on the CRM side doing the marketing. So it's, it's fascinating to me to see the differences, but I a hundred percent agree. I have seen the smoke and mirrors model for CRM and, you know, social media, whatever the, whatever the technology it exists, right? Where they tell you that it can do it, but they can't show you, Oh, that right. module is not working right now. Oh, we're making some tweaks to it. Oh, we're refining it. And then once it's been implemented, I've actually had to design a marketing module to track campaigns so I could show an ROI. Like you never want to be in that position. So having your requirements, but I think to your point also is prioritizing your requirements. Because when you go in and create your requirements and you ask your salespeople, what do you want to track? Or you ask your sales manager or the president, they want to track everything. And a lot of times that's not realistic. And what I've found is and I, I'm going to turn this into a question and ask for your comment on it as well, is what do you, how do you recommend that people prioritize those requirements? Yeah, I mean, really, the if you're looking from a sales angle, if you're a sales manager, you want to be able to see what your salespeople are doing. So you want to make sure that they can store those activities. And as much as you can automate things, the easier, the more you can automate it, the easier it's going to be. So like right. one of the things that we do is we synchronize with your inbox. So we do it differently than most other CRMs and that we use IMAP to synchronize in the background. Most other CRMs will have you in your inbox and if you actually click the click and like send and add to CRM, then it gets added to your CRM. But in, over 90% of the time, people don't do that when they should. Because it's a it's a pain, it's different from their behavior. Sometimes salespeople feel like, well, this particular message I don't want in the CRM for whatever reason. And then it turns into a, a thought process, it gets in the way of business, and then the data doesn't get in the CRM, which is bad for the business. Right. And so and, right. and you think about that in in all different aspects of it. But you want to have your email marketing done so that when you're sending out a newsletter, you know, or someone makes a purchase and you have an automated follow up that that's trackable. So all that information should flow in automatically. So what I, what I usually talk about when we're talking about the very beginning steps is get your salespeople using the CRM and hook up their IMAP email, so their, their inbox if you're using Gmail or Outlook or whatever. Mm -hmm. Get that synchronized up to the CRM so that all that one-to-one -one communication gets in there. Then also make sure that they have their calendars in there and so they set appointments and the whole thing. So we've got a booking calendar if you want to set appointments for me. That helps. So from a sales side, that's where we start. From a marketing side, do the email marketing. Take our web tracking bug and put it on your website so you can track when people from CRM are on your website. Set up, And then we can talk about automation a little bit down the road. We can set alerts and the whole thing when people start generating lead scoring points and all that stuff. So that's, that's sort of advanced. you know. So really what I talk about is using the, the, the fundamental stuff for salespeople and then for marketing, doing web tracking and email marketing. From there, there's a ton more stuff we can do with customer service and all that stuff, but but start with that. 
Okay, so if you were looking at getting started and you're putting together your data model and your processes and understanding, I've even seen companies not have a clearly defined lead versus opportunity or what creates a lead, right? Like I think that some of these are essential business questions that need to be answered in order to manage your business overall to get started. Um, and so making sure you have these these understandings and then looking at the process and prioritizing what are the most important things for the process for your business and what data you need across along the way. Does that, is that an accurate statement? Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, this is one of the things that really bugs me about Salesforce in particular, because they have this thing where someone is a lead and then they can turn into an opportunity or a contact and all that. I mean, it just <laughs> the water and it makes it such a confusing, stupid mess. So awful. <laughs> Right. In our system, contact is a contact. It's a person. And that person will be in any different, in any number of different phases. They can be assigned to multiple different groups. But a contact is a contact. A person is a person. A company is a company. And I mean, I don't know why that was, that's so hard. But apparently with other CRM companies, it, it is. I, I, that's just one of the things that's a pet peeve. And we have to explain to people that there is, a person is a person. <laughs> you know? So, but, but once we get past that, we look at how do we set up the association of this individual, this person, with the sales process. So we identify where are they in the sales process. Do we want to create an opportunity because they represent some potential revenue for us? Do we want to track a conversion or associating a value with some action that they've taken? So a lot of this is us working with the company to understand when do they want to know this? When do they want to create this, this opportunity in the sales process? How do they want to track this conversion? What are the stages of opportunities or the stages of conversions as people go through that buying process? And so it's a very consultative thing because everyone runs their business a little bit differently. They've got different size businesses. They've got different strengths. They've got different ways of distribution, different ways of tracking things. And so we want, obviously there are some, some standards that we will help people with, but it's, it's different because every business is a little bit different. And I think that's important to remember. So as we're going through um, this conversation, how each of you can apply this to your own business and understand how and really why I'm such a big proponent of having the centralized information to, better, to provide better service for customers, um, you know, for leads and even customers all the way through, which is something we're going to touch on as well. But as we, you know, we've mentioned Salesforce and their craziness of the lead and the contact and the opportunity, which drives me nuts every time I have to work with it. Because <laughs> um, it's confusing. It's so, con it's so confusing. I've used Salesforce on and off for like over 10 years. And whenever I can avoid it, I do. Anyway, enough about Salesforce. So we talked about the different priorities and the requirements, building the requirements before people even go out to search for the right CRM tool. What, um, what should business owners look for when reviewing and vetting CRM software companies? Yeah, that's a good question because there are a lot out there. Um, I generally speaking, unless you're a Fortune 1000 company, I would stay away from the big brands. Honestly, I mean the the companies, the sales forces of the world, Microsoft, Oracle, SAP. I mean they're they're great if you have a huge development team and you're a giant corporation. I mean it's and and not to take away from those companies because they're they're there for a reason. If you are an enterprise uh -huh. company, then that's that's really where you should go. Um, but most of the people that we are talked to, most if you have if you have under you know a few thousand employees, you probably can get away or not get away with. It. You'll be better served by a smaller CRM that's more integrated out of the box, and that's really where it comes down to understanding the requirements of all of the things that you need your business to do. So, understanding all when you when you make your requirements of what you need the CRM to do. Have those down and talk to a, to a company to make sure that they can demonstrate that they can meet those requirements. On top of that, look at their pricing model. Look at how they charge. If they charge based on user, be very cautious because CRMs that charge per user, you will be as a business owner and, and people in the business will be tempted to share logins, which is a terrible idea. Do not ever share logins because it kills your accountability and it kills the ability for you to separate out 
who the users are that are doing what, and 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 that creates more confusion. So, if you are looking at a per user pricing model, make sure that you really build that in properly. A lot of CRMs will charge more if you want to have a more capable user, um, and so sometimes you know, like in the multiple hundreds of dollars per user per month, if you want to have this, do a lot of things. So. Um, the other part is make sure that if you're adding on marketing related uh, functionality that you have pricing based on look at how much they're going to charge you for sending out emails for example is that is that all inclusive or do you need to pay more do you need to pay more to do some of the more advanced functions or is everything included look at the use of if you are going to have to use an api to connect different software pieces look if there's a cost associated with the api so what this is, is looking at what we call the total cost of ownership. So total cost of ownership includes the actual subscription to the software as well as the cost it takes to get you up and running. So if a system requires a lot of integration work, you're going to have to hire a lot of developers to link those pieces together, and that adds into the total cost of ownership. And so if you think about the long run of what you want your CRM it's going to track sales, it's going to track marketing, it's going to track customer service, it's going to track events, it's going to track projects that you may be working on. All of these things typically will require another piece of software. How much is it going to cost you for that other piece of software and how much is it going to cost you to link that together? Then the last part is about service and customer service from that vendor because you have to have a good sense of confidence that that vendor is going to be there for you if you have questions or you have issues or even strategy or you want more training. How hard is it for you to get that support that you need? And typically, the bigger the business, the harder it is for you to get good customer service. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it seems like a like a it should be it should be a no brainer that if you're going to be using a subscription based software package, you should be able to get someone on the phone, get someone to set up a go to meeting if you need to get on live chat, answer an email, whatever, you should be able to get good service. And so I would say that between all those, you've got functionality, you've got cost, and you've got good customer service. Those are the big things to focus on if you're a business owner when you're picking the right CRM. You make so many good points in that. And one of the other things that I wanted to add is that from my own experience, I've seen so many times that companies, when they purchase the large software, they think it's going to do everything and then they don't want to pay for the extra modules or they don't realize that the reports that are created will actually give them the information they need to run their business. Um, you know, they're reports designed typically for larger businesses. And so Taking into account also the manpower if you decide that things aren't going to be connected because you don't want to pay for the API, right? Like it's a cost that you have to pay the programmers and everybody else to do the development, but it's also a cost on the team if you're not, if you choose to try and work around that. And that's something I think that people don't fully realize when they're vetting is the manual labor if you have to do workarounds is in frequently a lot more time than with the larger systems because they're not built to be more as agile. Yeah. Well, and, and you think about it too. I mean, people are busy, right? And, and some people like to give salespeople a hard time, but if someone's a salesperson and they're making phone calls or they're going out and they're meeting up with potential clients or clients or whatever, you don't want to expect your salesperson to have to log into more than one system for them to do their job. Right. You don't want to have to say, okay, you're going to call on this lead. I'm going to need you to log into your CRM to see the sales-related data. Oh, and then you're going to have to log into the email marketing program to see what they did with the email newsletter we sent them last. And, oh, you're going to have to log into the customer service system to see if they opened up a ticket or how that ticket was involved. Like, no salesperson is ever going to do that. All they care about is how do I, how do I get, look at my notes that I just made if that data is not immediately available. And so what I talk about is having, and this sounds kind of funny, but having a relationship with your CRM because most people have a one-way relationship with their CRM. Their manager tells you, you will use the CRM or I'll fire you. <laughs> and then the sales says, oh, great. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So they go in and they put in a minimum amount of notes if they put any in at all. And they fake it because they're not getting anything back out. But the idea of having a two-way relationship with your CRM means that everyone is contributing information to it. 
So when the salesperson logs in to make his notes, he automatically and immediately sees what did this person do with the last email we sent them? Did they open a support ticket? Did they fill out a form? Did they watch a video? Did they like us on social media? Because all of that will drive the conversation. Yeah. It will help them sell better. So it, it's, it's typical. I mean, information is power. So you want to arm the salesperson with that information. And I, you can see the difference when working with salespeople that have that information mm -hmm. and those that don't. So yeah, if I, you know, I've been doing a lot of vetting of sentiment analysis tools for clients lately, and I can absolutely 100% tell which ones are using like a CRM software to be able to tell me what's happening and what actions I've taken and which aren't. <laughs> oh, absolutely. absolutely. Because it drives the conversation. If the okay. salesperson knows you've been clicking on certain things on an email or that you've been on these particular pages on a website, they know how to drive the conversation that way. And, okay. it, and it flows naturally. They don't have to say, so what are you interested in? Right. Because then that, ends up, you know, you, it's, it's a tangled, it's a, it's a messy conversation when it, when it can be clean. Absolutely. Absolutely. On a side note, um, one of my favorite stories about trying to implement Salesforce is when the university decided to start with Salesforce and I kept trying to point out that there wasn't some of the marketing pieces we needed. This was the first implementation, not the second one. Um, my team and I ended up bribing the Salesforce consultant to make marketing reports so I could show the data I needed to. Uh, one of my employees made cookies for them because he'd been traveling. So I bought all the ingredients and we made cookies for him for like a month straight in order to get the reports that we needed to do the job. <laughs> like right. Right. Most, most, most consultants can't be per bought with cookies, by the way. <laughs> that was just luck. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that even with those cookies, he was charging you an hourly rate. Yeah, yeah, I know. But still, I didn't. It wasn't on his priority list, so the cookies at least bumped it up to the priority list. Right, and that's the difference. When you have when you have a platform, it's different than a out of the box solution that has these that you need already built. In. So you know, the platform is very powerful, but it takes it takes many hours and very expensive hours. Most CRM consultants are one hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars plus an hour. And when you think about how much effort and time it takes to build these custom reports for you, because they're not built into the system, it requires many hours and a lot of cost. And I'm pretty sure most of the people in your audience would rather not throw away four or five, ten thousand dollars on a report when they can get a CRM that already has that report built in. Right. And it wasn't like a crazy report. It was a report to tell me how many leads came in by channel so I could start looking at ROI and what was influencing what. Like it was a possibly the most simple marketing report you could ask for. Um, a month of cookies. <laughs> uh, and, and the right CRM should do that right out of the box. Yeah. It should be easy. For you to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so you mentioned a little bit in terms of cannabis, you know, we talked a little bit about cannabis specific CRM tools and, you know, versus the, the more customized, you know, the ones that require a little bit more customization in order to manage your business. And I, I really like your point about, you know, if everyone's using the same tools, then you're going to be approaching the customer all the same way, even though you might be putting your own spin on it. Um, what are the can you do you can you think of any considerations that a cannabis business would need to take into account? And I'm going to lead with one answer for you already. Um, sorry, is one is, <laughs> one is the email system, right? Like an infusion soft won't allow cannabis companies. Certain companies right off the bat won't allow emails to be sent. So I know that that's one area. But are there any others that you think that businesses should take into an account when they're looking at at vetting tools? Well, it's actually kind of good for businesses that they don't get suckered into Infusionsoft. Infusionsoft has a terrible reputation for the emails that they send out because they've, they've sent so much spam out of their networks that yeah. most of their emails get blocked. Um, and so it's good that no one falls down that trap. Um, <laughs> So, but and it's, and it's so bad that they have other third-party companies that you can work with to hopefully get better email deliverability because they've sent so much spam out. So, but the but the issue is you want to make sure that your emails end up in the inbox. So, 
And that's just a matter of permission and being responsible with the way you do email marketing. Don't don't buy lists, don't rent lists, don't don't spam people, which it, nowadays you would think would be fairly obvious, but people still kind of do it. So so you know, just make sure that you understand that you shouldn't be doing that, but the company that you're using for your CRM and your marketing should also have the same stance not allowing spam through your networks because that's how you get email in the inbox, which is important. The emails that you send that end up in the spam folder do you no good. So, and that's really what we want to. We work with our customers to help them understand that, and also how to how to do content. When you send messages out, there's a, a concept called optimization, where you send an email out, and you're not sure what the best design or method or the, the text is going to be responded to the best. And the best way to do that is optimizing the content by testing it. So you send a message out and you see who opens it, how, which one is most, most effective at getting people to take action. And so you want to make sure that you have access to those kinds of tools built into your CRM and your marketing program that allow you to really customize the, that messaging, personalizing it, and then learning from the different kinds of campaigns that you send out. Now, at first, when you first start, that may not be a big priority. You may just say, I want to send an email out once a month, and that'll be my newsletter, and that'll be it. But at some point, you're going to say, I have a 20% read rate and a 1% click rate. I want to figure out how I can turn that into a 25% read rate and maybe a one5 or 2% click rate because that will move the needle on your revenues. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh -huh. do that? You do that by testing. You do that by, by trying different colors, trying different designs, different subject lines, different headlines, seeing which ones actually work better. And so with our platform, we have a really easy tool that lets you just kind of throw up a couple designs, blast it out, and then it'll automatically pick the winner and then send it to the rest. Um, and we can, and it's tied with the whole conversion tracking system and everything. But you want to make sure you think through that whole process and make sure you have the tools that support what you're trying to do when it comes to the point where your business grows and you want to start doing that optimization. And only test one thing at a time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you want to be careful with it. Multivariate testing can be a little mathematically challenging. And make sure you're testing one thing. Don't change everything and then try and figure out, backtrack into what worked. Um, yeah. Awesome. Love it. And I actually, I forgot that I touched on email, which you know all about email. <laughs> so... Um, one of the things you mentioned earlier that I want to address, and I think it's actually really, really important, is the customer journey. So mm -hmm. you touched on a little bit before. Can you define the customer journey? And then I want to talk a little bit more how that layers into CRM tools and why it's incredibly important to consider and pay attention to. Yeah, so the, the customer journey really follows the progress of a journey or of, a, of an individual customer going from when they first learn about your business to becoming a customer and then after. So what we want to do is, is create a model. Now, creating a model doesn't mean like something super complicated. Really, it's more about understanding. So I want to sell to this particular kind of person. Maybe I'm selling um, a, a, uh, I'm a dispensary or I'm selling to an individual, individual consumer or I'm a grower and I'm selling to in dispensaries, whatever the case is, there's going to be a process that people go through. You're going to want to make sure that you understand what that process looks like. So if you're trying to drive people to your website, what happens when they get to your website? What are you trying to get them to do? Most companies will say, I want to get them to fill out a form or purchase from me and capture a certain amount of information in that process. As part of that process, then what do I do? We want to engage with them and figure out how to get them to participate in our business. So does that mean that you host webinars? Does that mean you send white papers? Does that mean you send a newsletter or maybe all of the above? Maybe you do things on social media. How do you get people to interact with your brand? And when they do, where is that information going? You should be measuring all of those interactions whenever possible so that if someone is watching a video on your website or someone attends a webinar or someone stops by your office or whatever the case is, that that information gets into the CRM. As part of that, when you're modeling this customer journey, so the customer goes from one point to one point to one point, you're going to want to look at where you can automate 
that relationship, the inner, the communication in there. And what that means, and marketing automation is not a new term or new technology, but using it correctly in the context of your CRM, it is not as easy as it would sound. You really have to think through this process and think, okay, so someone goes and they fill out this form, that indicates that they're interested. Does that mean then we kick off an email to them, and then what happens if they open that email or they don't open that email? What happens if they click on this link and they go to this particular web page? How do we want to drive them to do that? Is that by sending another automated email with the discount code? Do we want to drive them then to participate in our social media channels, to join a group? Do we want to drive them to come by our office? Whatever the case is, that model has to encapsulate what that customer journey looks like. What happens if? And when you look at that and you look at the places that you can automate, you say, okay, I know that I'm going to have to explain the same thing over and over again to this person because they're going to need to know fill in the blank, whatever that is. Maybe uh, what our customer service policy is. Maybe it's um, here's information about where we grow. Here's information, you know, whatever it is. Automate that as much as you can so you're not using humans to do stuff that computers should do. That's why we invented computers, why we have machines, so that we can automate those things and let the humans do the things that humans are really good at, which in most cases is this human-to-human -human interaction. It's the conversation so that the salespeople are spending their time actually on the phone or actually meeting people and not spending their time in front of their computer typing in the same notes over and over again calling the same people and explaining the same thing over and over again. That's not what you want salespeople to do. You want them to think creatively. You want them to be engaging, not, not don't treat your humans like machines. Let the, let the machines do what the machines are supposed to do. That's a really good explanation. I'm going to steal that for when I teach my next class. <laughs> Because I teach the customer journey and laying that out. One thing that I tend to add, and I wanted to ask you about this, which is it's a little separate from CRM, but when I teach doing the customer journey, when I work with it with clients, I talk about their experience. So actually taking it all from the point of view of the customer or the client. So if you're looking at selling to a dispensary, you need to know who at the dispensary is actually doing the purchasing, but also you need to know that they're super busy and getting hit up by a million different other products and growers and distributors and such. So you need to take that into account of how they're feeling at each step and what, mm -hmm. to your point, then what you can do to drive that. I feel like that empathetic, like adding empathy to it does add some power when you're actually looking at the content, not just the process. That's absolutely true. I mean, there is an emotional component to the sales process and that has to be taken into consideration. Um, you know, the, most people will tell you that the buying decision is made by our lizard brain before all of the conscious, you know, logical, whatever stuff, you know, the engineering, because I come from an engineering background, so my brain thinks very logically, but I know that most people make decisions very emotionally. And so the better you're able to model what that emotional experience is through the customer journey, the better you're going to be able to engage. And, and I, I mean, it's like, I think it's Seth Godin said that. I mean, marketing is a is a competition for other people's attention. Yep. You have to understand how to get other people's attention. And that is, it's really applied psychology. Thinking about, so if someone is at this stage of the buying process, how do we psychologically engage with that person and try to influence them to buy from us? Because that's what the successful businesses do. Yes, it's, it's the <laughs> Absolutely. That's what I always used to. When I first started working for CRM companies, no one knew what that was. So I would always like, it's the junk mail that you get that you don't think is junk, right? It's the stuff that you, that might appear in, you know, at the time it was direct mail and all of that. It's the stuff that you receive that you're excited to receive, not that is wasting your time. Like the 40,000 messages that we all get on LinkedIn trying to sell this stuff. Um, it's really paying attention to what they care about and to your point, how to drive that forward and using technology and all these amazing tools that we have available now to replace some of the things that had to be done by hand and manually in the past. It's such yeah. an amazing opportunity. <laughs> it is. It is. And, and, you know, it's funny because some people will tell you that email is dead, that email marketing is dead, and it's not. The, the concept of just sending out a 
bunch of junk is dead. I mean, there, we get enough email in our inbox. But if you can make your content relevant and timely, then email is an effective tool. Then you get people who will actually read and engage. When they see something that they're interested in that's coming at the right time, that's, that's when you, you get that engagement, when you get people actually paying attention to what you're sending out. Absolutely. And I think that especially for cannabis businesses, and I've talked about this in the past with some of the limitations on advertising and social media, that being able to get, whether it's text or email or even mobile messaging, being able to use those elements to be able to reach people, make those tools even more important and critical for our success because we're limited in some of the normal advertising that everyone else uses. And, mm -hmm. you know, 2018. <laughs> yeah, and don't be afraid to do things that other people don't. I mean, other people will tell you that print is dead. Right. You know, but we have a partner that we work with called Postalytics that we do automated personalized content sent by postcard or by a little special box or whatever that gets sent out that's personalized print content because a lot of people don't do that because they think print is dead. So if that fits into your strategy, think about it. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's, you know, direct mail done right can get it. I've seen it. It can get a ton of a ton of hits and a ton of re great response when it's done right. Once again, cannabis businesses, you have to be really careful. And uh, Lars, you mentioned something earlier that I want to go back to because I've heard so many times that people think that because it's B2B, you're speaking to the business, not a person. And I, I, I really dislike the term, but you know, you're always marketing to a human, whether they're B2B or B2C, cause, cause it sounds a little trite, yeah. but it's absolutely true. You are marketing to a person no matter what. Yeah. And it's a little bit of a, of a trap, Like you know, one of the things that it has been going around a lot, people are talking about account based marketing, mm -hmm. um, or APM, you'll hear that and they'll say, well, yeah, you're selling to a business. So you want to keep track of the business, which is tempting to lump everyone together into one account. But like you said, you're still talking to a person. There's still a person involved in that sales process that you're either you're selling to them or their boss or there may be multiple people, but you're still sending messages to individual people. You're still on the phone with individual people. So to your point, you want to be very careful not to just lump everyone in a business together and then and not treat them like individuals, like like people and personalize the content that you send to them. Absolutely. I love it. Um, let me see if I had any more questions because really I honestly could just keep talking about this for hours and I don't want to do that to you guys watching. I don't want to do that to Lars. <laughs> um, so I want to go to the speed round. First of all, so first of all, once again, you guys, I'm going to plug Lars's book. He's going to give it, get a chance to tell you how to connect, but CRM for dummies as someone who's worked in CRM on and off for a million years, um, it's a great book. Fabulous read. Well done. <laughs> took me a year. Took you a year <laughs> to write this? I believe it. There's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of words in here and some pictures and oh. where's my camera? There's a lot there's a lot in here. And I think yeah. I mentioned before we started, this is the second person I've interviewed who's written a for dummies book. So the rest of us need to get on that. because um, <laughs> it's awesome. Okay, speed round. You ready? Do you I am ready. All right, here we go. Do you have a favorite cannabis product? So I use uh, CBD oil. Uh, a good friend of mine got for my knees because I have, um, I'm getting older, I found out. And um, <laughs> <Of course. laughs> my knees don't look the way they used to. So uh, I, my favorite is a, is a topical um, CBD oil that I absolutely love. It's amazing once you find that product that you just like hold on to it. <laughs> yeah, I actually give some to my dog too, and he, as far as I can tell, he loves it. Hey, a little <laughs> bit. <doesn't> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, do you have a favorite quote or mantra that you live by? This um, one's tough if you don't have one off the top of your head. Yeah, so the one I have on my computer is no matter where you are. But I don't know if that's really inspiring. Wait, <laughs> one more time. More, Sorry, I um, lost you in the middle sort of there. Like What's it say? No matter no matter where you go, there you are. And and it's actually a, a, it's a quote from an old cult uh, science fiction movie um, from when I was a kid. Uh, so well, you, you probably I don't think you were even born yet. 
Sorry, the dogs. Um, real life, you guys. Dogs in the house and the mailman at the door. Um, I, I feel like that's an excellent quote, and it's kind of a master of the obvious, but let's just assume it means to be present. <laughs> Well, yeah, a lot of it, though, like, is, is I think, in terms of perseverance. You know, it's, it, nothing happens, nothing happens, okay. nothing happens automatically. You have to, you have to put a lot of energy in. Uh, and so, if you're, if you're starting a business, um, and you think that it's just going to happen easily, that, you know, just because, especially, you know, there's a lot of money in cannabis. And, um, Tempting to think that, well, the, the whole industry is so flush with cash, I can't go wrong. But I've seen it. I've seen it where people don't take the time, don't have the self-discipline to do the approach you were talking about. Before. Think about all the things that have to go into running your business correctly. So if, you, if you're not disciplined like that and you don't have the perseverance to work through that process, it will come back and will impact your ability to grow your business. So what we want to do is, is help help companies see all the way through, but understand that when you take on, you're going to take on a CRM, you're going to build a CRM, you're going to make that part of your culture, it's not an easy button. It's not a thing that just happens. You have to go and, and do the hard work to think about the strategy, to think about how to implement that strategy, and make sure that everyone buys into your vision because it's, it's not just going to happen overnight and it's not going to happen automatically. Sure. We, so we have on Green Rope, um, you can go to greenrope.com. You, you know, our culture is very much of a, we're not a hardcore sales type of organization. So we try to help businesses. We're actually, we're, we're privately held. Um, so we've never taken on venture funding, um, which is a conscious decision that I made to make sure that we maintain focus on providing really good customer service and a good customer experience. So um, we are not the biggest company, and we don't take on everybody as a customer, but for companies that want to have a very powerful CRM that will ultimately save them over 90% total cost of ownership and over 90% implementation time, that's who we want to work with. And, um, you know, like I said, we, we grow very, very uh, organically. Oh, hey, look at that. Um, and, um, and, and really, we, we focus on helping our customers. And we have some very large customers, and we have very small customers. So, it, you know, we range from from customers that have hundreds of thousands of contacts and hundreds of users down to startups. So we work with all different types and kinds of businesses in all different industries. Um, but we have a promotional code of MOTA, um, M-O-T-A. Um, if you go to the Green Europe website and request a demo um, and use that MOTA um, promotional code, then you'll get a 10% discount on, um, on your Green Rope account. So uh, one of those things that we do um, as part of this to, to be part and, and to support you, um, Kendra, and everything that you're doing so that your listeners and watchers can, uh, can get a little bit of a discount. So um, go to greenrope.com to look at the software. I'm on LinkedIn, um, Lars Helgeson. Pretty easy to find me. You can Google me and find me all over the place. Um, and then the book CRM for Dummies is available on Amazon um, if you want to download that from there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to connect with anybody and ask, answer any questions that you might have about your business. I'm happy to be a resource. It's not. It hasn't been recorded yet, or it hasn't been mastered yet. So I'll post it as soon as I, as soon as I have it. So yeah, I did a test about a month ago. Um, so yeah, it, it should be ready here soon.
Thanks for having me.